And so just to let you know, the session is being recorded. All right. So the purpose of the session today, um, the, the field-based preparedness project uh, is looking or proposing to develop uh, an enablers guide. What this guide will do is to target organizations that have a strong operational experience, but are wishing to support uh, the locally led practice of others. Um, those organizations with operational experience can be other international organizations. Um, they can be national organizations that are looking to support um, actors at the subnational level and so on. And so what we're looking for today is we'll run through some background of the project um, localization and capacity development, just, just by way of giving a context. And at the end of that, the bulk of this session uh, will be spent on trying to get your feedback on three key questions here. Would uh, a preparedness enablers guide be, uh, would it be helpful? Would it be something that you or your organization would find useful? What scope, structure and content would make you want to consult it? And what should it address for you to consider the guide as being relevant, useful and novel? And the way we're going to do that, um, as I said, we're breaking the, breaking the presentation into two main parts. I'll run through some background on the field-based preparedness project. Uh, we'll look at uh, the localization spectrum and locally led practice. Um, and there we'll have a, a short exercise using Mural uh, just to get used to it, because that will be the, uh, the tool that we use for the, for the uh, main discussion just to see where does your organization fit within that localization spectrum. Um, and then we'll be looking at how institutional capacity development can support localization and leading toward um, locally led practice. After that, we'll move to the discussion section of the, of the session, um, where we'll be going through those three guiding questions we, we looked at uh, earlier. Um, and seeing how might the, what does the preparedness enablers guide need to look at in order for it to be useful. Um, at any point in the session, um, if you have questions about a particular slide, um, please put your hand up or just, just open your mic and let me know. Um, if I don't see your hand, um, then uh, please just uh, break in or Anne will also, uh, will reach out. And by the way, sorry, is Wipoa in the chat. So, um, all right. So first of all, let's uh, have some background of the preparedness project, just to give you a context, uh, an understanding of where we're coming from. So the project's objective is the enhanced capacities of disaster management organizations, um, Normally that is, or for the project, it's usually the national disaster management organization, but it could also be at the subnational levels as well, but crucially, and other local actors. So not just with the NDMO, but with uh, uh, collaboratively with other actors uh, to deliver timely and appropriate emergency response services through the strength and coordination and coherent operational behaviors and practices related to national humanitarian supply chain preparedness. So throughout this, we'll be referring to humanitarian supply chain, but most of what we're saying um, will is actually sector neutral. Uh, it applies to, to any, any humanitarian sector at all. The project started in 2018. Uh, it's the Global Logs Cluster's response to the 2016 Grand Bargain Commitments on Localization. To date, uh, the project has spanned 21 countries globally, and we usually, as I said, partner with the National Disaster Management Organization, uh, and it focuses on collaborative humanitarian supply chain preparedness. Okay, so little bit different from the cluster's normal work, which is disaster response. This one is very much focused on, on preparedness. Uh, project evolution. The, the project 
evolves in three ways. Um, we have annual workshops or annual meetings where we try to bring the national stakeholders, our representatives of the different government organizations we work with, the project officers and other government, uh, sorry, and other partner organizations, bring them together and try to really work out what is what is what is working with the project, what do we need to be thinking about, what do we need to be changing. Um, we also try to incorporate feedback from uh, project field, office, field officers as part of the operational support. Um, and we also continuously um, have internal evaluations and try to review as much as possible and incorporate academic and research literature. Um, I'm not going to run through all of the, all of the points there, um, but just to give you an idea of, of the types of uh, work that we're looking at. Um, just to note as well that these slides will be available after the, after the session, uh, if anybody's interested. So the project's original approach starting in 2018 was really the provision of on-demand technical trainings um, as usually as requested by the, the national stakeholders, warehouse training and the like. Um, a project facilitated gap analysis situation. And this is where the officers would work uh, to develop with the NDMO um, a gap analysis. And coming out of that would be the uh, preparedness action plan, which would you know, ideally uh, set the path for, for activities for years to come. What we found though, uh, through this was there was quite poor outcome sustainability. Um, and this, this led to our revised approach in 2021. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the, um, the particular challenges that we faced um, that, that led to this revision later on in the presentation, if you're interested. So the, the, three, the three main ways that the, the project has evolved as a result um, is we've, in, we've introduced a demand-driven institutional capacity development approach. Um, so um really trying to to direct this much more about what what is the the national uh stakeholder appetite for this um advocating for a systemic or a non-fragmented perspective and we'll be touching on that in a in a bit as well and really really emphasizing that national stakeholders need to be leading and involved deeply involved in every single process that that we uh that gets undertaken So with that background of the project, um, I now quickly want to jump into the localization spectrum uh, and uh, locally led practice. And we'll end this, uh, this small section with a quick exercise on mural uh, to see where, where your organization might fit on that. All right. So if we, if we look at the broad span of localization, um, then we start from the individual, which is as local as it's possible to get, um, and go all the way to global systems. Global systems being things like the Interagency Standing Committee, the UN system uh, as a whole, and so on. Within that, there's a whole range of different levels that we can look at. Um, so going from left to right, we've got increasing degrees of localization um, with the, the, the next one from global systems being international organizations at their global level. So the headquarters of WFP, IOM, IFRC and, and so on. The next level down, uh, international organizations, but they're in country presence. So the country offices of those organizations uh, then we have the national and subnational governments and uh, associated stakeholders, civil society, private sector, um, community led organizations and then individuals. Just to note, um, this is um, this is not meant to be uh, complete. It's not meant to be um, prescriptive. All this diagram is is really just something to give us a, a, a bit of a handle on. Um, where the different pieces fit together. All right. So within that, when we're looking at locally led practice, we're really looking at the, the national, uh, national government um, and then further to the right. Um, 
I, I know this is obviously uh, obvious to a lot of people, but um, I just I just really wanted to point out that when we mentioned the word localization and locally led, led practice, the different organizations will have different definitions of what is local. When we get to the mural, um, you'll see that on the right hand side of it, um, there's a there's a list of uh, resources, for example, and you'll we've we've fleshed out some of those arguments and some of those links in there. All right. So within uh, those different definitions of uh, locally led practice, the field based preparedness project is focused very much on the national government. Uh, and in some cases, subnational governments as well, um, and their associated stakeholders. Sorry, one, one point I should have, have made clear as well is we need to be very clear about the difference between localization, the process, which is what we're talking about uh, today and how we can help support that, and the and the end and the end of the sorry. And, and the destination, right? Locally led practice. Locally led practice is, is really where um, we we're aiming to get toward. So the rest of the, the conversation today will be focused around uh, the field-based preparedness projects area of focus um, at the government level. But I just wanted to make sure that we didn't, um, didn't forget the, the other areas of locally led practice. So within this, two main versions of, of localization, if you like, or locally led practice. If we start with the IASC's definition of this, um, this is where um, the IASC defines locally led practice as meaningful participation, representation and leadership of local and national humanitarian actors within IASC coordinate, humanitarian coordination structures. Right, so you can see the linkage there, for example, between the, the country offices of the international organizations uh, and the, the government there. So it's really national actors with external actor support. One way of thinking about this is partial transfer. Um, the, the transferring of the operational part of preparedness capacities to national actors with the purpose of them having a more strategic role in the future. Another way of looking at this then um, is the fully autonomous uh, nationally, nationally led practice. Uh, and uh, if we go with the UNISDR definition here, then we're looking at national institutions being able to effectively anticipate, respond to and recover from the impacts of likely imminent um, or current disasters, right? So this is really um, full autonomy of response. And here we might be looking, uh, a way of looking at this is full transfer. The transferring of all capacities to local and national actors with the purpose of enabling full autonomy of national response. And this is really this idea of full transfer. This is where inter, uh, institutional capacity development starts to come in. So with that, um, what we'll do is have a break so you're not listening to me talking all the time. We'll go to Mural. We're going to use Mural twice uh, in, this, in this session. The first is primarily um, a familiarization exercise. Um, what we'll do is we'll put the, the link in the chat um, and get people to jump into that. I'll give a short introduction on, on how to use Mural um, because I think there's, there will be people who are quite familiar with it and people who are not so familiar. What we'll ask you to do in there is to put your name and organization somewhere on the localization spectrum if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, then that's also very useful for us to know in this, um, what, what have we missed? The other thing, um, there is no space for this on the Mural or there's no identified box for this. But if you, if you find this localization spectrum a useful concept or not useful, um, your thoughts on that would also, be, uh, would also be really useful. So let me put the link into the chat here. Um, if, and then with that, what I'll do is I'll also share my screen. Um, and bring up the 
Let me roll if I can find it here. One second, there we are. All right, I can see a few people in there. If anybody's having trouble, please either contact, um, please either send a message to Wipawa on the chat or just open your mic and let us know. So on the right hand side, you'll see some resources. If you're interested, they'll remain up there for the, for the length of the session. Um, and then at the top, we're asking, where does your organization fit? So what for people who are not familiar with Mural, simply double click somewhere um, and that will provide a small post-it note. You can then uh, just, if you're on a tablet or some kind of device, just um, zoom in um, and that will let you, um, uh, that will let you adjust. Let me see if I can do the same on the screen. So you can just zoom in and then because I'm working for the Global Logistics Cluster, I'll put my name here, Aaron TLC. But because I'm working with uh, Global Logs clusters and organizations that sit in country, the uh, offices, then I'll put it somewhere between those two. Um, you'll see there that there's some of the areas that we know that we've not um, included in the diagram just for the sake of simplicity. Uh, so we've got regional organizations, for example, academia and research institutions, but it's also good to know if uh, we've missed uh, anywhere else as well. See a very large post-it note in here. I might keep the... I can reduce that. So set a timer for a few minutes. Um, if you have any thoughts on issues with the localization spectrum, whether it was useful or not, or how it might be made more useful, um, please also put a, put a note in there as well. Um, and this familiarization exercise is two ways. It familiarizes uh, people with using Mural, but it also helps us to become familiar with uh, the participants in today's audience as well. Not quite sure how to remove this this large-ish post-it note there. It's like technical hitch there. We'll 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 deal with that at the end of the at the end of this session. Couple more minutes. Um, let me have a look here. A couple of people from academia. That's great. I see Juan in there. Hi, Juan. Richard, nice to see you. Temi. Oops. Is there anybody that's um, not sure on how to use Mural? Um, please do reach out to Wipawa, to Anne. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be using Mural fairly extensively on the, on the next part of, of this.
Um, and for people that have finished, um, just on the right hand side under resources, you'll see, for example, some of the contrasting definitions of localization. This comes from some very recent ODI research. On the, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see two gray boxes as well. If as we go through the, as we go through the session, uh, the discussion part or the presentation part, if there are things that you feel that we should have covered but did not, or things that were not clear or just general points that you feel are important, please by all means capture them and put them in the parking lot. That will be really useful for, for us to go as we go forward. Um, and if you're interested in staying in touch, whether it's um, uh, being updated on the progress of the uh, preparedness enablers guide going forward, or um, ideally, if you would be interested in participating in its development in some way, whether reviewing or providing inputs from your particular uh, perspective, please put your, your name and contact details down in the staying in touch or uh, just drop a line to Anne, to Wipawa, or myself in the in the chat. All right, just about out of time. And there we are. All right. All right. With that, I would ask everyone to come back to the to the presentation. Yeah. Sorry, Aaron. Before yeah. we move to the next slide, um, there is one question from Mohammed in the chat. Not sure if you want to address it now or later. Sure. What's? Let me just have a look at the link. Is it in the? Uh, in the Zoom chat. The yes. Um. So he asked. Um. The FPPP project is quite useful. Is Somalia part of the country's targeted? Um. Are local NGOs and community-based organizations getting support? Yeah, so um, uh, thank you. Thank you for the, for the question there. Um, what, we, what we try to do is, is with the preparedness project, the, the key word is, is collaborative. Um, so we, we really strongly advocate with the National Disaster Management Organization that any, any work be done as part of a preparedness working group. Um, and so that it's at that point um, that the different NGOs that might be involved in this, um, that would be their, their entry point uh, uh, there as well. Um, I don't know if that answers your question without going into into depth or not. Uh, if you'd like to open your mic, uh, you're also very welcome, uh, Mohamed. All right. Maybe, um, Mohamed, as we go forward, that might be something worth raising in the in the second half of the agenda of, of uh, in the discussion um, to make sure that that is captured as well in the, the enablers guide. All right. Um, and and if, uh, if somebody asks a question and I don't fully answer it, um, by all means, let me know. All right. So having looked at where the, the field-based preparedness project, um, it's, its context, and now having a bit of an understanding of um, uh, this idea of the localization spectrum um, and locally led practice, um, and now I just quickly want to then delve into how institutional capacity development supports this idea of locally led practice and particularly outcome sustainability within that. All right. So we, we saw this idea earlier of partial transfer um, where we transfer the operational part of preparedness capacities to national actors with the idea of them having a, a more strategic role in the future. 
Some of the ways that this is done, for example, can be capacity augmentation, building infrastructure, handing it over is, is quite a common one. Capacity substitution, for example, where we might do an analysis for the government um, and hand them a report afterwards, or capacity building, training national actors in, in specific technical areas. I mean, so this is all uh, in support of operational capacities. The problem with this um, is it's really only part of the picture. Now, if, if this is something that the, the national counterparts have requested, um, then, you know, anything that is demand driven, it needs to be driven by what it is that the national actors are, are requesting. The problem with these, um, these points though is by themselves, there's really very little in the way to support outcome sustainability. So if we look at operational capacity, some of the questions that we need to be thinking about or the national, we need to be supporting the national actors in thinking about are, you know, are those preparedness plans grounded in multi-stakeholder collaboration? And this speaks a little bit to Mohammed's question earlier on. Have the critical capacity gaps been identified? Do implementers have sufficient staff knowledge, uh, procedures and equipment? But as you can probably guess by the dotted outline, this is not enough. So we also need to be thinking about the regulatory environment. Um, if we're running warehouse training, for example, under operational capacity, but the, but the regulations are not in place to support the continued operation of the, the organizations that hold that warehouse, then you know, we, have, we have an issue there. Um, if the organizations that, that own the warehouse that are responsible for disaster, disaster management are not recognized by other players, are not coordinated with other players, then again, the warehouse management training is of, is of very little use. Planning and finance really needs to be a, a part of the picture as well. Do the different actors value this idea of preparedness? Is there evidence to support it? Uh, is financing uh, predictable? Is it clear? Is it actually entered into uh, budget lines? And are, are other actors uh, actively engaged in this? And by other actors, we mean you know, both the organizations that may be normally involved in some kind of a humanitarian response. It might be organizations that are newly involved in that. Um, and it can be, and it, you know, it, as well, um, the private sector, academia, all of these organizations um, really need to be involved in this to have a, you know, a robust and resilient approach to, um, to preparedness. Um, just one thing to point out here is you'll see that we, we've mentioned a few times in here um, this idea of humanitarian logistics, humanitarian supply chain. Because the field-based preparedness project is very much focused on the humanitarian supply chain, then a lot of the language has been tailored around that. The thing to stress here is that, is that the model and these aspects here are completely sector neutral. Um, this can be applied to any other uh, humanitarian sector as well. Okay, so even with looking at, you know, uh, the regulatory environment, institutional effectiveness, operational capacity, planning and finance, engagement of others, this is not enough um, to, to really support national actors in um, outcome sustainability toward this. There's one absolutely critical part missing from this. And that's the, the national actor ability to be able to um, create, replicate, and maintain all of these processes. Without that dot in the middle, over time, as context change and people leave, um, these capabilities are at risk of um, at, at risk of being lost. So this idea of full transfer is not just the capacities around um, laws and uh, accountable institutions and uh, predictable financing. It's also this idea of capacities around creating, replicating, and maintaining all of those aspects as well. So as, as I mentioned earlier, 
Um, I just wanted to quickly run through some of the concrete um, areas where we face challenges in, uh, in the field-based preparedness project. And many of them are you know, really driving us toward this idea of coming up with a preparedness enablers guide in that you know, by, by trying to note down some of the areas where we've had challenges um, that other organizations might benefit from this as well. I won't go through in detail, um, but if uh, people have uh, other examples of this, please, by all means, put them down in the mural as we go through later on. The biggest one that we face, for example, is a lot of the concepts and definitions are really fuzzy. They can be very difficult to articulate, really difficult to operationalize. And if you're trying to explain them to government counterparts, to national actor counterparts, it can be really, really difficult. This can be exacerbated where um, you're working with staff who come from very strong technical backgrounds in a particular area. In the case of, um, uh, in the, case of uh, the Field Based Preparedness Project, for example, a lot of the staff come from very strong uh, supply, humanitarian supply chain backgrounds. Um, but the, the skill sets needed to enable others to do is quite different. Um, so it's it's how do you how do you help the enablers? So how do you help the people with strong technical backgrounds? How do you help them to enable others? Um, hiring structures may not acknowledge the difference in skill sets between uh, people who are very adept at doing uh, and the different skill sets that might be needed to be layered on that to enable others. Um, the enabling organizations uh, indicators and timelines might be much more focused around achieving results rather than increasing the capacity of others. Funding structures generally do not support the long-term nature of capacity strengthening. Um, conflicting localization approaches, different organizations, different enabling organizations will have different approaches and the, the national counterparts are in the middle of that trying to work out what the different organizations are bringing to the picture, uh, sometimes even different languages around the same thing. Uh, and this is the idea, for example, between competing approaches between different organizations. Um, and, and this competing approach can even be one part of the organization might be looking at capacity development activities. The other part of the organization, the same organization, might be looking to support the national actor through direct intervention of some sort. Um, and also to note that the, the mandates of, of national counterparts, stakeholders, uh, may not directly align with the mandate of the organization that is doing the uh, capacity strengthening. These are just some of the issues that we've, um, that we've found to date. Uh, if you have more, or if you disagree with any of these, please, by all means, um, this is what we're hoping for today in the chat, in the discussion. All right, so that's almost enough of me talking, um, a little bit more and then we can leap into the discussion component. So looking at how do we support outcome sustainability within uh, localization toward locally led practice through the use of capacity development, here is where we start to look at this preparedness enablers guide uh, that we've been mentioning particularly, oops, and, and those three questions, which I'll run through in a minute. Okay, a brief introduction to the preparedness enablers guide as we conceive it at the moment. This is not set in stone. If the purpose of the discussion today is to really get your inputs um, so that it will help us fine tune this, okay? The target audience, of the Preparedness Enablers Guide are those organizations with strong operational experience that wish to offer enabling support to others. The purpose um, is really to, to offer guidance in terms of how do you design and offer enabling support in consultation with national stakeholders in a way that is systemic, that is demand-driven, that's all of those things we've talked about. At this point, um, the, 
the basis for this uh, guide is coming from the project's own field experiences, from stakeholder feedback, from all of those different channels of evolution that we talked about earlier, uh, academic lit literature, and really importantly, from sectoral fora like the one today, right? This HNPW forum today uh, is really important. And the guide's purpose really is to address the challenge of poor outcome sustainability um, and this idea of partial transfer of capacities. So in essence, we're trying to move, we're trying for those organizations that wish, we're trying to support them in this move away from partial transfer to this idea of full transfer in support of locally led practice. Okay. So again, a reminder, and these will be in the mural. It's the same link that we had before. Um, asking your inputs and thoughts on would an enabler's guide be useful? The scope, structure, and content, what, what do you feel should be in there that would make you want to consult it? And what, what points should it address for you to consider uh, such a guide as being relevant, useful, and novel? Uh, so we're going to do it in two, two or three main parts, two, two parts. We're just going to have uh, an open discussion in mural based on those three questions. We'll spend about 30 to 45 minutes on that. At the end of that time, what we'll do is open up some additional sections in mural to give you an idea of what, what is the sort of structure and things that we have considered so far just so that we can then say, based on your inputs and suggestions, this is how it aligns with what we've thought. Um, but we felt it was really important that, that people come at this and they have a, they really get to get their own inputs into this without being influenced by uh, what we've come up with so far in the team. And again, the whole idea of this is to take your inputs and really use that to drive the project forward. All right, um, so with that, um, if you can click on the same link, um, we'll head back into the mural and I'll open up those new sections in there again. I can find it on my screen here. All right. Seems to be a slight hitch, so I'm going to stop sharing. Let me just open those sections first. There. You should be able to see in the screen now on the mural um, the just the the points around the target audience, the purpose of the guide, um, and and why we feel it is necessary. Um, along with those three questions down there. I'm just going to restart the screen sharing and I see there's some questions in the chat that I'll answer. I'll just set a timer here of 30 minutes um, and see how we go from there. Um, as we said earlier, um, if anybody wishes to open the mic, um, if you wish to have a, a verbal conversation as well, by all means, and the last thing we want is, is for me to be talking for the next 30 minutes to myself. Uh, Mohammed, I, I see your comment there and your um, and your your Gmail address. So thanks very much for that. We'll certainly reach out to you after this.
Um, please let me know also if the if the questions are clear. Um, if the questions are not clear, um, by all means, that's also useful feedback for us as well. So I might I might be mean and call on a few people in the uh, a few of the participants um, just to give your your thoughts on 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 this. Um, I'm not going to go through in any particular order, um, but I see Juan. I see you're at the top of the screen there. Um, can I get you to just to give your your thoughts on this uh, and uh, maybe from the IFRC perspective? Over. Thank you, Aaron. Maybe next time I will not switch on my camera. But <laughs> thank you for the for the opportunity. Uh, I, I was just writing. Uh, yeah, from 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 my experience, I think this would be critical. Most of the capacity strengthening initiatives that I have been involved, for examples that we have been collecting from the Red Cross, they have been initially triggered from operational gaps, which I think is is good. They have been addressed usually by very centric technical sectoral kind of support to those specific needs um, and in most of the occasions not necessarily paying attention to the enabling environment um, and therefore yeah not really addressing or trying to minimize the risk of not being sustainable so from supply chain for example yeah, either there are as you have been mentioning focusing on assets or, 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 or transferring knowledge on through these kind of trainings but yeah, once the funding or the specific project ends, um, it's quite difficult. And most of the many of the of the cases, um, these um, outcomes have not been sustained over the time. So from our internal reflection, uh, we have been coming up that as important as the technical side is this enabling kind of environment and try to think since the beginning how this is going to be sustained. On that regard, yeah, for us is really critical from us at the IFRC. We work with our members, are for our members, with the Red Cross represent national societies, uh, to really think from the beginning as an organization, as you have been mentioning, which is their mandate within the national disaster um, structure. Uh, is it really a clear mandate or not? Are the services or this mandate really relevant? Now, uh, at days, maybe they have been doing for the last 20 years, and maybe nowadays other actors, they are on board or the government has taken over. Maybe there are new opportunities. So really going to this out of the technical side uh, is very important. And many people, they don't really know how to do it. So I think a, a, a user guide or a guidelines to go beyond the technical side, I think it will be beneficial. Thank you, Juan, for that. Dominique, I see your hand. Thank you, Aaron. Good morning, colleagues. I'd like to uh, build on what Juan was uh, mentioning um, because I fully agree. And I think there's also space for enabling partners to understand better what makes for sustainability because this initial focus on providing support through to address operational gaps, which is, which is of course critical and will remain critical going forward, really focuses on the instantaneous creation of capacity. But there's very little out there to guide practitioners on what focuses on capacity retention within stakeholder institutions, as well as the ability um, for those institutions to maintain and create critical masses of capacity. And this leads to, um, or calls for a better understanding from enabling players, enabling organizations and partners, as to what are the types of support uh, actions that they can take? What are the actual institutional processes that they need to, to strengthen with stakeholders for these elements to be addressed? Because sustainability in reality is not just about creating capacity, it's about making sure that it sticks over time. 
So I think this type of a guide can be uh, a, a great place to start fleshing out what that means in very, very practical terms, as one of the colleagues on the mural has, has mentioned would be important. Just a reflection that I wanted to share. Thanks, over. Thanks, Dominique. Um, any any responses of, uh, from other people to Dominique or Juan's points? Otherwise, I will continue going down the list and, and picking out names. I see. Um, Richard, could I ask, could I call on you just to give your perspectives um, uh, from uh, your time with um, working in PNG um, and your thoughts around um, a preparedness enablers guide from that perspective? Sure. Sure, Aaron. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo really what, what Juan and, and Dominique have already said. Um, the slides you presented earlier on the challenges were quite sobering. I mean, almost all of them put the context here in Papua New Guinea. Um, and it's sort of, um, it, I mean, it's, I guess, a, a guide for me, uh, you know, being being in that that potential enablers position would be how to overcome those challenges and, and how to address those in, in practical terms, the things that, that are required for the, the sustainability that, that, is, um, that you mentioned. So um, it's, you know, some of those things are, are, are beyond the scope of our capabilities as, um, you know, international organizations based here in, in Papua New Guinea. But, um, you know, it's, 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 as you mentioned, it's, it's a collective effort. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, it, it's a scalable effort where we can, um, actually that's a good, something I didn't write here, but something I would be interested in, in exploring further is sort of the scalability is, you know, what are some small things that we can do to build towards this or um, maybe even sort of timelines that we can look forward to, to, um, uh, to help us as enablers sort of better think this through and, and think about our uh, approaches and supporting the NDMOs. Over. Great, thanks Richard. Um, Ashwini, I see your hand is up, please. Uh, hello, I'm Ashwini Satnur. I'm a zero hunger champion in World Food Program. Uh, one aspect which I could uh, define is, could we create knowledge building and knowledge enabling books and resources and activities and webinars and sessions and awareness generation campaigns, if we could add that for the enabling uh, guide, would that be sufficient for uh, partnerships with educational programs also? I'm, thank you for that, Ashwini. I'm going to hand that over to uh, Dominique, who I see whose hand is up. Please, Dominique. Oh, apologies. Thank you, Aaron. My hand was up for a different comment. Um, but I do think that, Ashwini, your comment is, is extremely helpful. There is nothing more important to sustainability than engaging with those entities in country that will be contributing to national human capacity. So one of the things that we've learned through the FBPP experience is the importance of um, considering all of the different players in the local context, because in fact, the FBPP doesn't focus just on the NDMO, but it focuses on a wider uh, whole of society type approach. Because if there is a way to engage with um, uh, academia in country and to integrate some of the thinking and the learning that's emerging from these efforts into the programs and the courses and the modules that these institutions make available to the new generation of professionals and practitioners, this is a way also of beginning to uh, shift the internal mindset um, this may not be exactly what you were speaking of, Ashwini, but it did give me uh, that connector. And that takes me to the point for which I had raised my hand, Aaron, which was to, to pick on something that Richard said, made me think um, when we look at what we believe to be the remit or the scope, the sphere of influence of our respective organizations and country, I think it's very important to recognize that stakeholders also have their perceptions of what that remit is, what that possibility is. And a big part uh, of this initiative 
also speaks to changing perceptions around what we can offer when we're called in to address operational gaps and technical capacities and capabilities. And perhaps, Ashwini, that links to what you're saying, because in fact, there is definitely a space for awareness raising and, and knowledge strengthening, let's say, with regards to what enabling partners can do and how they're going to do it. And perhaps this guide is, is a first step in that process. So I just wanted to share that. Over. Yes, so could I submit few technical proposals regarding this research area to the enablers guide also, marking the various tasks, activities and assignments which could be worked upon and which I would undertake to proceed with this particular enablers guide. Aaron, I leave that one to you. Yeah, um, by all means, Ashwini, um, I, I think at this point we're, we're uh, brainstorming, so um, that, that uh, input would be very welcome. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. If you could drop in your email address, I would be able to reach out to you with the technical proposals. All right. And could, could I ask your assistance in, in doing that um, to Ashwini in the chat for me, please? Yes. yes um, I'll reach out to you, Ashwini. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity. I'm glad. Thanks, Ashwini. Um, I'd like to call on Mohammed, who's been um, putting some useful suggestions in the chat. Mohammed, if you if you would like to um, to speak to uh, some of the your comments in the chat, over. Oh uh, yes, hello. I think you can. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, the, you know, we need a win-a-win situation. Uh, the topic is very useful, but uh, we lack, I mean, the resources. Uh, if we get the resources and also technical support, we can deliver a lot on ground since we are very close to the community and also we are in, we are in the field at that field level. So far now, I mean, uh, our organization is local. Uh, local organizations, I mean, get a little support. But I mean, if we get the capacity building, institutional capacity building, we can deliver a lot. So far, we're just relying on the internet and also getting some I mean, resources I mean, from websites. But if we, get, if we get these materials and the models, we can deliver a lot. Communities, we are very, very close to the community. We can uh, empower them, we can train them, and we can do a lot of awareness on ground. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Many thanks, Mohammed. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to go down the list. If, if there's anybody who would like to, to jump in, um, please, by all means, do. Otherwise, I might call on one or two of the, the, the project officers to, to give their experience, just to give some idea of what have been some of the, the challenging areas that they have faced um, in trying to support national stakeholders? Um, Tammy, can I come to you first and then to Zarina afterwards, if that would be okay, over. Hi, Anna. Uh, good afternoon, uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, so, Thank you on this um, opportunity. Uh, specifically on the enablers guide, I think it is it is crucial, uh, especially if in the in the absence of uh, elaborative uh, approach guidance, what I have uh, seen as well uh, locally in my context of uh, implementations of FTPP in Bhutan that uh, there are still a lot of development partners uh, adopting the uh, capacity substitutions or capacity augmentations, uh, and they are all pretty much uh, short-lived in terms of approach and, and, uh, and enabling uh, long-term change. And this is probably uh, due to uh, the current approaches of the government as well as well as uh, difficulties in, in identifying uh, support resources among the development partners. So they tend to be, to be very short-term oriented. So in the future, if we would like to, to do that transformative change and introduce 
uh, institutional capacity strengthening. I think this is crucial for for the global logistics cluster to basically raise this awareness on the approach and and issuing you know additional contents, guidance, etc., so that they can replicate in a more systematic manner and in a more uh, consistent approach, um, especially among the other preparedness clusters. Um, on the challenges, uh, personally, I can relate to many of the challenges you listed down uh, during the project implementation. And I have added one more challenge uh, because I've, I'm actually going through and experiencing uh, this, this particular challenge which I just posted on the chat, which is you know, um, higher than expected or sudden turnovers among government uh, staff. And the worst part is that those changes are mainly at leadership and managerial levels. So whether we like it or not, at the technical levels, everybody uh, seems to be happy and aligned in, in moving forward and implementing the, the plan activities, but since government uh, agencies operate very much on a top-down uh, approach, they have to resort to wait for a while until, until clarity is obtained and approval or endorsement is, is obtained from the, from the leadership or the new leadership. And, and this is what uh, we are going through at the moment. I don't know if that answers your question. Over. Thank you, Tammy. I mean, that, that's really valuable. Um, and I, I think it, it highlights one of the key words in there, which is the institutional aspect of institutional capacity development. Um, it's, it's that it, trying to embed this stuff in a way that it, that it manages to sustain over staff turnover. And that staff turnover, you know, it's, a, it's an issue both within the counterparts organizations, but it's also very much an issue in the, organi in the organizations we work for as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm only calling on people I know because I, I feel it would be rude to call on people that I don't. If, if I'm not calling out your name and you would like to speak, please, by all means, we, we'd really encourage uh, people to speak up. Um, while we wait for some for, for, for people to, to open their mic or put up their hands, I'd like to call on Zarina, who's also working with the project. Um, just Zarina, maybe if you can talk a little bit about some of the difficulties you faced um, in trying to, to explain the, the terminology and the concepts involved in capacity strengthening with government counterparts, if that would be okay. Over. Thank you. Um... Hi, this is Irina uh, from Tajikistan, uh, National Preparedness Officer. Um, I hope uh, you copy me well, yeah? Okay, thank you. Um, there are, um, at the beginning, there were some, um, some um, challenges, yeah? This is, uh, I agree with my uh, colleague, yeah, Temi, and he, mentioned that um, buy-in um, is uh, the um, uh, is a, a big challenge and uh, the political will and the um, uh, interest yeah uh, because uh, in our country most of the agencies and the INGOs, they, um, I consider this that they pampered already uh, our and the yeah, was giving only um, aid, was uh, making hundreds of free, uh, trainings and uh, um, giving some assets, yeah, uh, just for free, some vehicles. And now, when you come over with uh, this uh, institution, institutional capacity strengthening and with the localization, they, they, they are, um, you know, they, uh, they, they don't want just to do by themselves because they got used to that somebody's doing for themselves. 
yeah it's 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 a, it's a bit uh it's a bit um challenging situation in our country but um now they they are trying very slowly uh to uh make some contribution uh i mean uh they are calling now they want to be um active and when you make the comparison with the other countries they 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 are um, very much uh, interested in showing Tajikistan's results. Yeah, that, that's it. It's it takes it takes um, it is longer period process, and uh, this is long term sustainability. <laughs> uh, you can uh, you have to ensure the long term sustainability. Um, with uh, your uh, uh, with the support, yeah, and uh, this FPPP uh, project period is uh, I consider it to be short. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Zarina. Um, before we move to the next session uh, or the next part of, of this session, um, just to a, a final shout out to see if there's anybody else who, who would like to, um, to have a voice here. And also to see, is there anybody here that is working for um, a, a government uh, counterpart here that might have, the, um, have a different perspective on, on capacity strengthening? Not seeing any hands, but please, by all means, if, I, if I'm not seeing your hand, please just jump in. All right. All right, with that then, and we can come back to this, we can come back to this topic. We've got about um, uh, 20 minutes left, uh, if my timing is correct. What I want to do now is just to open up uh, the remainder of the mural just to give you an idea of, of the types of things that we've been thinking about uh, uh, so far, and then to see if we can tie that back to, uh, to some of the uh, comments that people have made today. So, so far we've been thinking about four broad areas uh, within, the, um, within the preparedness guide. And just let me see if I can work out how to uh call everybody here okay Someone. okay um we've got four parts and if if you'll just bear with me what i'll do is um i'll just uh guide you around the four parts first and then people can go and, and have a look at whatever part is uh, is of most interest the first um, section that we're thinking of, how can organizations, right, either enabling organizations or the counterparts or the, that they're working with, how can they work out whether institutional capacity development is an appropriate path or not, right? There might be cases where the national stakeholder says, look, I just want very particular trainings, or the national stakeholder says, I, I have absolutely no way of absorbing the type of um, information that you're going to be giving me with capacity strengthening. Um, so this is this is really um, probably the, the key entry point for us of um, how do we how do we collaboratively with the national stakeholders work out should we be taking a capacity strengthening approach or should we be taking some other type of approach? Um, and so the optional question here if people are interested in um, after reading the text on the in the grey box on the left, um, what other factors should national stakeholders and external organisations consider during this initial assessment? Remembering that this is not the this is not the enabling organisation assessing the stakeholders. This is a joint assessment by everyone of what is an appropriate approach here. The second aspect here, I'll just call everyone in here, um, is looking at um, how do we ensure that whatever is being offered is in fact demand driven, right? Um, 
rather than being a, a case of we have something to offer and, and uh, using that to define what is what is presented to national stakeholders, how do we make sure that whatever we whatever it is that we have on offer, that it is driven by the demand of the people that we'll be working with? Um, the, the key here is that uh, institutional capacity strengthening, this type of long-term deep engagement can really only be effective if national stakeholders request it, that it's demand-driven, right? If they understand what is being offered, that it is in fact much more than ad hoc trainings. And if they see it as being more effective than the other options they might have on offer. So the two optional questions here, how might external organizations like IFRC, WFP, IOM and the rest, how might we go about understanding the concerns that national stakeholders might have? Um, and the second one is related, what, what do you think um, they might be weighing up? What do you think they might be considering before engaging in an institutional capacity strengthening uh, partnership with an external organization? The third part that we're thinking about, and I've seen this touched on a little bit in some of the responses as well, is if, if an organization is saying, we would like to start working with national stakeholders from an enabling approach, right? If we want to do that, what are some of the things that we as an organization need to be thinking about before we get into that? Some of the challenges that we see, for example, are this moving from immediate results, um, and a lot of organizations are very much focused, that they have annual indicators on, this is what was achieved in the year. But when you're working with the enabling capacity of others, those results take much longer to achieve, and they're much more around the growth of the organization that you're working with. Uh, and the other uh, thing that, we, that we've been thinking about is the critical role that national staff play in this, in that the, they stand between the international organization's country office and the national uh, organizations that we're working with and play a really critical role. So the, the optional question here is, what factors, issues, or challenges do you think the enabling organization's management needs to be aware of before transitioning from an operational approach to an enabling approach. And the final section, and I'll summon everyone for the last time and then you're free to move. Okay. The fourth section is really building on the materials that we've already got to date. You'll see that there's a link down the bottom here that takes you to the guidance materials um, that, that the project has developed for field offices to date. Um, but the question here is, how do we, really, how do we support um, operational staff, people who come from a very strong uh, technical background, a strong supply chain background in this case, how do we support them better in, toward enabling national actors? So layering this, this, this idea of layering enabling skill sets on top of existing technical skill sets. So those are the four questions that we have in there in the, in the remaining time. Um, again, very happy for people to open the mic to come up with questions. If any of this is not clear, by all means, please just, um, uh, just speak up. Um, if you don't agree with any of these sections, that's useful information for us. If you feel that the, um, any, any aspect at all, whether you feel the, that uh, might be useful in, in tweaking this guide. Um, I'll stop talking now, um, but very happy for people to, um, uh, to speak up. I really should have hold music for these things. Um, so what I might do then, um, again, 
really encourage people to speak up. Um, what I might do is I'll go around and have a look at the, the uh, responses people have made um, and try and pick out a few that people might be able to speak to. I'm looking at one comment under the uh, HNPW uh, question one, um, where the somebody has responded uh, to the question, would an enablers guide be useful? Um, and they've mentioned in there, yes, but only if it focuses on practical and not on theoretical guidelines. Um, would be really uh, interested to hear from, from that person around this idea of enabling um, and some of their experiences of maybe where guidance has been too theoretical uh, so we can um, um, so that we can make sure that th these types of concerns are addressed. I don't know if that person would like to um, to expand on that comment. see any hands there. On the, um, on the comment in the same question, um, it would be helpful when there uh, be no indications on how to do the implementation. Um, could I ask the person who put that in there to speak to that point a little bit more? Would it be good to understand um, the types of things you were thinking about there. Over. Erin, apologies. I'm not, I think you may have misread the question, uh, the, the comment. And I just mean that, you know, just quickly, because he's saying, the person who's saying it would not be helpful if there were no indications on implementation. So rather, it shouldn't just be theoretical, I think was what the, the meaning was. Does, does that resonate? Yes, it does. Sorry for that. Need to get my glasses fixed. <laughs> Dominique, while I've got you online, were there any comments in particular that, that um, that you found um, interesting or are you know strongly resonating with uh, what we've thought about to date? So I'm just looking now because I've actually been focusing on some bilateral dialogue in the chat. So happy to just uh, I'm just going to scroll through them now um, and I'll share any thoughts if I have any. Lovely, thank you. Just one, one question that I have here, now looking at question number three, getting by getting by in from decision makers. Um, addressed to the person who put that comment in there, were you thinking more about the decision makers in the organization supplying the capacity strengthening or more from the national counterparts or both? Hey Aaron, uh, that was me, um, Richard from PNG. Um, I was uh, actually addressing the, the government side um uh there was a, it was at a um during a remark made by somebody whose name I, I forget um that you know there it, despite all of the the interest and in, and in, um and willingness at the operational level sometimes the, the at the the leadership level at the management level particularly i think at, at um like the the secretary or minister level which are often uh politically um appointed positions um that can 
that can be a challenge despite the, the interest at the operational level. So, I mean, so getting buy-in from decision makers was, was sort of looking at that senior within the government structure, the, the senior most um, members, um, including perhaps those, the, the secretaries and ministerial level over. Richard, can I, can I ask a, a, a follow-up question to that then? Um, in, in the event that you were able to get uh, buy-in from decision makers, what would be your things, uh, your thoughts in then having um, in, in the people that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis within the government, um, understandings around capacity, capacity development at, at that level, even though the, um, the, the higher-ups in the hierarchy have, have green-lighted it, hypothetically speaking? Right. I guess I was thinking more of a scenario where the the, the interest is there at the operational level, but the, there isn't the, the political will or the funding to, to support the, the, the investment. Um, if the opposite were true, which I think is what you're suggesting, which I think is what the, the scenario is you're proposing, um, that would wasn't really what I was looking at. But um, uh, yeah, that would be a different approach, I think. Okay. Did I get your? Did I understand you correctly? You did. Thanks, Richard. Aaron, I do have one uh, thought I'd like to share with colleagues to get some reflections, if I may. Please. In the third box, question three, there's a very interesting comment that I think is a good segue into a wider conversation that I think is critical to everyone, which is the HDPD and the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus, which I think many of us struggle to really um, understand what that means in practice, right? Or apologies, at least I do. Um, but there's a comment here. Some of these challenges are very similar to those addressed by systems approaches to development. Perhaps those ideas could be brought here, for example, how to measure capacity building retention in the enabling environment. I think the first point of this comment is really interesting because in reality, even though as supply chain logistics, uh, you know, humanitarian preparedness uh, colleagues, let's say practitioners, we work in a sector or a sphere that's that's very emergency and crisis driven, yet we're under pressure to speak to this nexus, this whole approach of focusing on localization and sustainability by working in these other, let's say, institutional domains that, that are critical to enabling institutions to sustain and absorb this capacity, that effectively is a perfect rationale and narrative for speaking to the humanitarian um, development peace nexus. And I think that that's something that perhaps the guide we could look at expanding on a little bit. And I think it'd be very, very interesting to get reflections, inputs, experiences from colleagues online today and those who will you know, support the process going forward as to how they see that nexus coming out um, through this type of an approach. And if they do, I don't know if that resonates with anyone online, but would be very interested in hearing thoughts if anyone has any. Thanks. Thanks, Dominique. Any any responses to to uh, to Dominique there? Don't see any responses, but uh, certainly Dominique, something for us to take forward. One. <laughs> yes, for for me, yeah, it resonates quite well, at least on the way on how internally in my department we are actually split. And I'm not in charge of operations. I'm more in charge of this outside of the operations and not being hijacked by the day-to-day -day operational focus. For me, it's more thinking on once the operation, emergency operation finish and kind of all the budget and resources around, they are away. Yeah, how to try to support, in, in our case, the Red Cross Red Crescent capacities in the logistics domain, but thinking on the, the day after. I mean, once all this source capacity external funding has arrived. So I think it resonates quite well. And the difficulty for me is how to try to get attention 
even internally in the organization and how to yeah, demonstrate or bring evidence that is worth keeping this kind of approach no on going beyond only the emergency phase funding resources focus uh, and why is it worth yeah, linking to the preparedness out of the of, of, of this kind of day-to-day -day emergency thinking and then it falls more on the on the development kind of side or for the nexus and this is the difficulty for me not to try to get attention even internally with the organization and try to get funding as well no around it so yeah i think it will be a very very interesting point on touching these two i mean localization as you have been presenting at the beginning but yeah, how to also link to the nexus i think this guide would be very interesting if something could be um yeah, some narrative could be put around it Thanks, Juan. Fully, fully agree. Um, Ashwini, please. Uh, I have a basic question uh, regarding the topics and the research areas which would be covered. Would it be, uh, when we are talking about technologies, would it be the latest frontiers of technologies which are required for awareness building? Is it uh, the new and emerging technologies and supply chain logistics and uh, the related uh, research areas which we would be covering during this enablers guide preparation? I, I think the at the moment the the enablers guide is more around the um, the things that different actors need to be aware of rather than advocating for specific approaches to to a particular problem. Um, so it would be it would be more around, um, you know, what what types of things um, might we need to be aware of when we're about to engage on capacity strengthening. The the part of the the document that deals really with the the how to do that, the guide for implementers, again is is um, it's it's very much around what types of um, what types of processes might um, might project officers need to follow or what types of conversations might they need to have with uh, with counterparts rather than um, using particular technologies um, which is not to say you know if we're looking at particular communication aspects um, that that it's at that point that the the different um, specifics might might come into play I don't know Dominique if you have any uh, any thoughts to add Thanks, Aaron. No, I think the guide will want to focus on strategies that can be adopted and where there is evidence or examples of best practice or specific recommendations that can be um, presented as additional food for thought for contextualization. I think it's always helpful to, to leverage what we do know and what is, is the current practice. But, but I think in general, I would agree with you, Aaron. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, basically, it would uh, feature in strategies and the methodology and processes for enabling this uh, particular approach. Yes, I believe that's correct, Ashwini. But again, as colleagues are highlighting, and as we also believe from the very outset, the, the success of such a guide will lie in how well it can fill that gap of operationalization of these types of theories and strategies. So where there are concrete examples of these strategies, technologies, approaches being put into practice, those examples are extremely helpful um, and very welcome um, because it makes it easier for colleagues to, to put things into a perspective that they can contextualize and see if it's feasible or not and what they could do differently. Um, does that help any? Okay. Yes, definitely. Okay. Yes, definitely. And I will uh, definitely work on this aspect. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Ashwini. Okay, so we've got three minutes left, um, which is a surprise. That time went quickly. Um, I guess probably at this point, um, just to say thank you to everyone for, for all of your, your inputs um, on here. Uh, it's given uh, Dominique and myself quite a lot of homework to do um, to make sure that those comments are 
um, are able to inform the preparedness guide going forward. Um, so the, the next steps for us are really to, to collate all of the inputs um, and then to start to come up with a, with a much, uh, what much more refined uh, idea of, of what the guide might be looking at. Um, and I imagine that the, the next point of um, uh, public conversation around this will probably be at the, the Global Logs Cluster meeting uh, later this year. Um, but in the meantime, for I see that a few people have, have very kindly put their, put their names down in the staying in touch. So thank you very much for that. Um, don't see anything else in the parking lot. Um, and that's, that's, all from, that's all from me, just, just to acknowledge, because I didn't do it earlier, um, that really a lot of this work has, has come from Dominique. She's been the driving force behind a lot of this. Um, so to, to thank you, Dominique, for, for all of your hard work to date on this. A uh, lot more to go yet. I'm um, just wondering if you had any points to, to close with before we end the session. Wow, thank you for that, Erin. That was um, <laughs> not required, but thank you. That's very kind. No, I think this is, uh, I think the best uh, takeaway, the strongest takeaway is that there is appetite. There is a white space for something that speaks to this uh, outcome sustainability challenge. So really at this point, we need to go to the drawing board and work out our next steps roadmap and then come back to colleagues as you've suggested. Um, I think all of the inputs have been extremely helpful and there's a lot of space um, to really dig into some more, some more of these topics in more detail. Other than that, thank you very much and, and hope we'll see more of you uh, colleagues um, in future sessions. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. I'll leave the, the mural open for another 30 minutes or so. So if you've got any um, additional points you'd like to put in there, please, we would be really grateful to capture them. Um, and again, thank you all for your, your enthusiastic participation in this. Uh, it's been really, really useful for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Dominic. Very valuable. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Samuel.